Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2015, brought to you by Mirantis. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Brick. Hi, Jeff Rick here with theCUBE. We are live in Mountain View, California at OpenStack Silicon Valley 2015. This is the second year of the show, the second year theCUBE has been here. It's really grown quite a bit since we were here last year. Went from one day to two days. We'll have to get the update on how many people are here, but it's a great buzz. And really OpenStack has matured quite a bit since last year, and the, and the conversations have really shifted into production deployment. Everybody's talking about production deployment. So, really excited to be joined here at our next segment by Alex Popolvi. CEO of CoreOS, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Absolutely, so you just came out of a talk, right? What was your uh, talk for the people at home that missed it? Yeah, so I, I was talking about um, some of the myths that people are running into about containers. You could almost call them memes. There's these things rolling around <laughs> around containers that are you know, just keeping, causing hesitation for, for adoption, and I just wanted to address some of those. So what were some of the... Um, so, for instance, that legacy apps can't run in containers, um, and talking about that. Um, I'm, I don't know what can't be containerized, actually, because at the end of the day, it's just a process running on a server, just like anything else. But for whatever reason, there's this perception that legacy ap applications can't work in containers. Or Another one is that your applications have to be completely stateless in order to run in containers. And again, we manage the state, we manage our databases, we manage how our applications store their files and so on. Um, through various techniques on servers today, and you still have to do the same things with containers, but it doesn't mean it's not possible because you're using a container uh, and, and so on. So th those are two of the four, I guess. But. I was going to say, it, it's surprising to me that there's even two or, or four, because obviously containers are all the rage right <laughs> yeah. now. Every every uh, header on every web page in, in enterprise space or open source space has a, a container ship with a bunch of containers on the back. Yeah. So, why is this? Because you talk to the naysayers and they'll say, you know, containers have been around for a long time. This is really kind of a, a repackaging of something that's kind of been around. Why is it getting so much momentum right now and why is it such a game changer today when it hasn't been uh, prior? Yeah, I think, I think everyone's ready for it at this point. I think, so, let, I, another example of this that I think happened was around like when AWS was released. When, when like Amazon EC2 was originally released, it was a very big deal. I mean, there were conferences about it and there was all this stuff, and what really happened? Well, they booted a virtual machine for you and they charged you per hour for it. And before AWS, there were all these VPS providers that were booting virtual machines and that were on you at least pay monthly for them, maybe it weren't hourly, so it was a little bit of a pricing model tweak. But I think the big difference is that people are actually ready to like consume compute in this way for the first time in a big way and sort of the market timing side of it was right. Um, the, the other piece of containers that I think is going on is, is containers represent not just this way of packaging an application, but actually this way of running infrastructure overall, which is this much more like what we've seen these hyperscale guys do. So it involves a lot of distributed systems and it involves sort of high availability and failover and all these things built in. It's not just that application being packaged. Right. And I think that side of things is, is where most of the excitement is. And that's where you see projects like, you know, Kubernetes or Mesos or Docker Swarm, those pieces, and all of the vendors in the container space are sort of duking it out for that that part of the of the stack, and that's really where the most interesting part of all of the container thing is, I think. Right, and and you think it's just a, it's it's a maturity of the software of, of that kind of methodology? Is it just comfort with it, or is it because people are actually starting to to change their business, change their development methodologies, change their business models, kind of taking advantage of this this new development paradigm? Yeah, if you will. I th I think it's just a shift that's happening around. Um, around like where the importance in people's businesses are. And the importance in their business is around the applications that they're running, not on like your raw server that's running behind the scenes. Like the server is becoming just this fungible resource that's used to provide access to your application, you'll provide resources to your applications that are running. And as things like cloud have helped commoditize compute more, you know, the focus on the application is becoming the, the thing. And I think that that shift we just are crossing a threshold right now. Things like Puppet and Chef kind of did that. They allowed you to like, define how to deploy your application against a set of servers, and right. now the containers kind of story overall is flipping it to the other side of the coin, saying here's, here's how my applications you know, consume these resources instead of kind of the inverse. Here are 
my servers and how do I run an application on them. It's kind of the, the other side of the coin, if right. that makes sense. So thinking about it that way first. Thinking about the applications first. And I think it's a really a, a, a timing and just where we are in the life cycle of the adoption of all these technologies. You know, everything goes one step at a time. Right, right, and then also just the portability and the transferability sure. of, you know, develop it on your laptop and Right. You know, so run one thing it we AWS missed. For, one, one thing we missed with OpenStack and AWS, for instance, is API portability. So I can't take my OpenStack, app, my application that's programmed against the OpenStack API, and run that against Amazon. They're two disjoint things. But the container, I actually have this logical unit that runs in both environments consistently, and so that kind of you know interop is one example of a, a benefit of this. And the only way that that's possible is by thinking about it at, a, at an application level instead of a server level. Right. That's funny you bring that up, because we uh, we covered the great AWS API debate a couple of years ago with Boris Ransky and uh, Randy Bias up in San Francisco at the OpenStack user group, and Randy was re you know really bringing up, why wouldn't we support you know that API, and that's kind of pre the, the container explosion as a different methodology to do that, but you know at the end of the day, the customer the customer just wants to deploy their workloads and that the, the method and or location of that could change based on the life, the life cycle of the, uh, of the actual application. I, I, I think for it to be done right, you need essentially what both Rackspace and Google are trying to do, which is a big public cloud service provider supporting the same open APIs that you can get in your own environment. So Rackspace did that with OpenStack and Google's doing that with Kubernetes. Google I think is, is doing it they have, I feel like Google has a better shot at it because they're not worrying about the hypervisor at all, and having to have interop between the hypervisors is quite a difficult issue. But having interop at the container level is a lot more manageable, and that's what Google's doing with Kubernetes. Right. Um, so earlier today, Google GA'd their, their Google Container Engine, which is based on on um, Kubernetes, so it's their equivalent of like the Rackspace Cloud versus OpenStack. Um, and I think that that has a, the true shot at portability. What would really do it is if Amazon and Rackspace both supported the, or Amazon Rackspace and AWS, uh, sorry, and Azure right. all supported uh, the Kubernetes APIs as well. Well now you're really getting some, some meaningful vendor interop. that interoperability. Yeah. And, and your, your uh, prediction that'll that's, is that only a matter of time for that well, happen? Well, so first, we will do that through our own technology, um, Tectonic, and Tectonic is our is our platform based around Kubernetes that, that we can, because all we need is compute resources, we can make it work consistently on Azure and on AWS and so on, um, you know, without the providers doing anything. Right. I just think to really get that true interop, you want the cloud providers to be on board with it, because uh, what will happen is the cloud providers are going to present their own options. So AWS is already doing the Elastic Container Service, ECS. Azure hasn't really made their bet yet on their container thing yet, but they're kind of embracing all. Right. Um, um, Rackspace hasn't done anything yet either, but but we will say here's a set of APIs that work on all environments, right. um, so you, including a pure open source one that you don't have to talk to us at all about if you want. Because at the end of the day, these are big companies, right? And it, 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 you know they're not just on one stack, right? It's really workload specific, job specific, application specific, and so they're going to need to be able to interrupt those things over time. Yeah, I think it's similar to what happened with Linux, like. Yes, there is still need for Linux and Windows and other OSs out there, but by and large on production web infrastructure, it's all Linux now. Right. Um, and you were able to get onto one stack. And how were you able to do that? It was, it was by having a truly open, consistent API and a commitment to not breaking APIs and, and so on that allowed Linux to really become ubiquitous in the data center. Yes, there are other OSs, and I, but Linux by and large for production infrastructure what is being used. And right. I think you'll see a similar phenomenon happen for this next level up where, where you're treating the whole data center as a computer um, instead of treating one individual instance as just the computer. And that's the stuff that Kubernetes and Mesos and so on is doing and I think there will be one that shakes out over time and right. we believe that will be Kubernetes. Yeah, and, and then, <laughs> And then potentially does the whole suite of them just become one single compute resource where there's intelligence that parses it out based on some other other uh, intelligence. So yeah, what's funny here is what happens is we take, so virtualization took servers and carved it up, a physical server and carved it up into a bunch of little servers. Right. What we're doing in this, you know, containers, cloud native, data centers, the computer ways, we're taking all these individual servers and turning them into one giant computer. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of the opposite. Kind of yeah, circling, it goes back, right? it's like going back to the mainframe days again. Right, and then right. it's so, it's so let's think, we're just, just pretend for a moment we're post that era. Well now we need to start having like, uh, this cloud, nat like these cloud native, or, or we need to have failover between these objects, these data centers that are acting like a giant computer. We need to start doing high availability across those and so right, on. Right. It's it's pretty interesting to kind of think about what happens next after all of this. Well, we kind of 
whatever we do with a what single server today, we're gonna have to do with these big distributed systems of servers as well. I don't know. It's started meandering a little bit there, but <laughs> no, that's fine. It's, uh, so it begs the question though: What are some of your your you know not long term priorities, kind of long term challenges? But what are some of the short term hills that you guys are looking to to attack next to continue to move this evolution along? Sure. So. We want companies to run infrastructure in this way, and the reason we want them to do that is because we think we can use that style of infrastructure to dramatically improve the security of their environments. So we started CoreOS around what could we do to fundamentally improve the security of the internet, and our observation was that this style of computing, this way that involves containers, that involves distributed systems, unlocks a possibility of, of managing your infrastructure in a way that's radically more secure than was previously possible, and so, we are first helping invent that way of running infrastructure by building all the components that don't exist in the world to do that. That's things like CoreOS Linux, things like etcd, our distributed data store, things like Rocket, our container runtime, um, you know, contributing heavily to projects like <coughs> Kubernetes that are a key, key part of the story as well. But then in the long term, we, we plan to leverage those things to help companies be far more secure than they've, they've ever been. Some some would argue, at least it was the early days of cloud, right? Is that cloud was less secure? That was that was kind of the, one of the first big hurdles that cloud had to had to kind of overcome. But you're saying it's more secure in this method. Why for the people that that, that see it as the opposite? I you know I like control. I like my doors. I like knowing who's got the keys. Sure. So our our hypothesis is that the key to good security is actually about managing updates. And the way that you manage updates effectively are twofold. One, you have to make them as automatic as possible. So attackers are using automatic scanning and attacks in order to exploit your infrastructure. As soon as a vulnerability comes out, they'll write a little script that knows how to detect that and just sweep the internet for it and hack everybody automatically that has that vulnerability, okay? So we believe the same uh, methodology needs to be applied on the other side. You need to be able to write a little script that then fixes all your server infrastructure automatically for you and doesn't require an ops guy to go and manually patch every single piece of infrastructure out there that you have, okay? okay. So we have to step up our game um, to that level. Now to make that possible, you have to be able to build infrastructure that embraces a bad update because it's inevitable that you're going to deploy something to your server infrastructure that, that actually breaks it, okay? So you have to have a model of the way you're treating your compute that is, makes it okay for you to deploy a bad update. So it's sort of double solving the problem, right? right, right. It's not just making the automatic update possible, it's also about making the, the when we screw up the automatic update, that be okay too, right. <laughs> okay? And, plan and planning for that. And planning for that. And if that's possible, well now you're truly in a position where you can, you can do this. Um, and so it's about the properties of how you're able to easily roll out and update your applications in a way that's, that's safe, um, that, that we think are very interesting about this style. Yeah, so um, get towards the end of our time here, talk a little bit about this event. Um, kind of what's the vibe, it's a brand new event, there's a lot of OpenStack events that are going on. We were just in Seattle last week, we were in Vancouver a few weeks ago, Tokyo's coming up, but talk about kind of the evolution of the community within the OpenStack world. Sure, I mean OpenStack, we were talking about how long has OpenStack been around? It's been five, around five it's years. Five, five years birthday. Yeah, I mean, it was January 2011, I think, right? So early 2011, late 2010. I mean, wow, they've done a great job. I mean, OpenStack is in. I, we're running into it in pretty much every major, um, you know, every major enterprise out there has touched it in some way. So it's been a great ride, I think. And, and congrats to the OpenStack team for doing that. Yeah, excellent. Well, Alex, thanks for stopping by. Alex Polvi, the CEO of CoreOS, uh, stopping by the Cube at OpenStack Silicon Valley 2015. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching the Cube. We'll be back with our next segment after this short break.